You are now tuned into Shotgun Sports USA. Powered by Winchester. Recorded in the U.S. And streaming all over the world. We talk to shotgun shooters from all disciplines, championship winning coaches, gun clubs, world class target setters, vendors, and industry leading companies that fuel the sport. If you are into clay target sports, you are at the right place for insider information from some of the best in the world every single week. Remember to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and connect with us on social media. You can also catch our episodes on ShotgunSportsUSA.com. Castellani shooting vests are manufactured in Italy and internationally recognized by elite shooters as the most popular lightweight shooting vests on the market. Castellani vests are especially known for their Italian styling and superior craftsmanship and quality making them a vest of choice for all shooting disciplines. Ultimate Shooting Accessories is the exclusive supplier of Castellani vests in the United States. Visit ultimateshootingaccessories.com for more information and to place your order. Being a brand name in the clay target industry, Rick Hemingway has said, Have you ever noticed almost all major sporting events are being run by pro-matic traps? Think about that statement for a minute. He's right. And you may want to consider that before making your next purchase. Rick is the largest Promatic dealer specializing in individual and commercial trap sales. Rick provides skeet, trap, five stamp, and sporting clays, designs, installs, and service. He also offers accessories such as solar panels, wireless release systems, as well as the hottest item on the market, the Claybot by Renair Products. Visit www.backwoodsquailclub.com or give him a call at 843-546-1466. My guest on the podcast is the owner of Rooted in Movement and is a human movement and vitality expert. He obtained his bachelor's in athletic training from the University of Pittsburgh and his doctorate in physical therapy from Duke University. He works with a wide range of people from Olympians to Navy Special Warfare to Major League Baseball players and everyone in between. Everyone, please welcome my guest to the show, Dr. Matthew Zanis. Matt, I'm glad to have you on the show with me. How are you? I am doing swell, my man. How are you? I'm good. Uh, This episode will be a little different than most of the ones we do. I would like to touch on the physical aspect of our sport and figured you would be the perfect person to have on. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what you do, and what Rooted in Movement is. Oh, yes. I'm actually uh, just a small town boy. grew up in the backwoods of Pennsylvania, about two hours north of Philadelphia, a little town called Pottsville. Um, Homie Yingling beer, if you're familiar with it, you're an East Coast guy, right? So uh, yeah, so it is the best beer in the world, in my opinion, but I'm a little biased. Uh, (laughs) But but anyway, like I said, I I grew up in a very, uh, I call it the backwoods of Pennsylvania, just because I grew up hunting, fishing, um, shooting a lot with with my dad and uh, just really enjoying um, the outdoors and everything that that came along with it. And I actually grew up in a, predominantly a baseball family as well. So my dad was a collegiate left-handed pitcher, which kind of took me down that path. I was playing baseball from the age of four. And uh, the only problem with this is that I wasn't really that great at it. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I didn't have the natural gifts that like my brother did, my dad did, and my actually my my uncles and my grandfather did as well. My grandfather was actually drafted by the pirates like back in the sixties. So wow. it was, it was kind of, it was in my blood. Um, I just didn't have those natural gifts, but I had a really hard work ethic. So I would just practice more, train more and, uh, just get hurt more. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I racked up like a whole laundry list of injuries. And then, um, I found weight training in high school and I realized that if I moved better and got stronger, all of these like little pains and nagging injuries and chronic, like chronic recurring overuse injuries would just go away. 
And uh, I was like, holy shit. And in that moment, I realized I was actually a much better uh, coach than an athlete, much better provider than a player. And I really um, enjoyed helping people more than advancing my own athletic career. And that's where I kind of did a pivot there and uh, took that into my athletic training degree at the University of Pittsburgh. So I was kind of that guy that was running out in the field if somebody got hurt. And then um, used that degree to work with the Pittsburgh Pirates for a little while before going down to get my doctor from Duke in North Carolina, um, which is actually, there's an interesting story there. I actually almost went to the University of Baylor for my physical therapy degree. And I would have went through the army and came out as an officer and everything. Because, you know, I love working out. I love shooting guns. And why not get my physical therapy degree paid for? That's Um, right. right. But I, I was talking to the recruiter and everything, and I almost... I almost went down that route and actually Duke was my very last interview and I decided to just go ahead down there and, and take it. And, uh, they took me into Cameron indoor stadium where the basketball team plays. I'm a sport guy. Right. And right. they're like, Oh, Hey, by the way, your grad student tickets are two rows behind the basketball hoop. And I was like, okay, where do I sign? <laughs> <laughs> you got me take $300,000 of my money. It's great. Yeah. Um, but, but anyway, like that actually worked out to be for the better because I have no regrets from that decision whatsoever because that allowed me uh, to work with one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Robert Duvall, who actually worked with USA Shooting back in the late 80s and 90s. And when I started my own practice, I freed up a lot of time for myself to do other things. And he actually, he gave me a call within like six months of me uh, going out on my own. He's like, hey, do you want an opportunity working with some shooting athletes at the Olympic level? I was like, uh, say less. We don't right. need to talk to. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he, he got me in contact with everybody. And then I've, I've been with them uh, ever since. But I'm, I'm currently out here in uh, Phoenix, Arizona as well. Um, the Cardinals actually brought me out here. So that's kind of how I fell in love with the area and uh, never looked back. I don't, I don't miss shoveling snow back in Pennsylvania at all. Uh, so I've been here out here for, for nine years. And it just gives me the, the freedom to you know, go north and be in the, in the forest again in the mountains up in Flagstaff, I want to, and then I can go to hit the beach in California. And then I have the international airport to really just go anywhere I need to, because traveling with USA shooting, you know, we're all over the world for about seven, eight months out of the year. (laughs) And that's your company rooted in movement. And so that, that was started back in uh, 2016. Uh, It wasn't under that name. I've kind of, I rebranded since then. Um, But it just rooted in movement is an acronym. So the movement part is movement, vitality, mindset, nutrition, and training. And that uh, just it kind of helps explain the holistic approach uh, that I take to working with athletes because it, it's not just about the PT stuff once people are injured. I like taking more of a proactive approach to working with athletes and working with individuals so that we can get really get to the source of the problem and not have to play catch up and be behind eight ball all the time. Give me an example of someone that needs your assistance. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that's. I'm kind sure of, <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, well, it's 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 kind of tongue in cheek a little bit, but um, like I said, I've, I've I developed myself into this into this niche of the tactical athlete or the shooting athlete. Uh, but I work with a whole host of, of people out here in Arizona, from like soccer moms to collegiate athletes to professional baseball players and kind of everything in between, along with uh, some of the highest levels of our our, our our military as well, including Navy Special Warfare, which gives me this kind of broad. Um, paintbrush from which I, I view movement from a whole host of different demographics as well. And the kind of the, the keystone of why I, I joke that, you know, everybody could util- utilize me is that I've got a brain for pattern recognition, right? Um, so everybody is going to experience pain at some point in their life. It's never going to go away. And there's a reason why we experience all these recurring different uh, injury mechanisms and and pain mechanisms because most of us never really get to the source of the problem and the source of the problem it comes down to how you're moving your body um, and how essentially you live your life and what your lifestyle choices are like so your nervous system is going to respond accordingly based on the level of stress that you have right mm-hmm. and that stress can come from literally everything from the physicality physicality side of things with how you are actually moving your body throughout your environment. Um, but then also from a psychological standpoint, a nutritional standpoint, emotional, spiritual, sexual, it's, it's all in there and it's all encompassing. And uh, my greatest superpower is connecting with people, right? That's what I love to do. I love to, to hear stories. Obviously you've heard already, I like to tell stories as well. Right. And uh, it helps me relate to them. And quite honestly, you know, the reason why I am so effective 
as a PT or as a movement coach is because of my ability to connect with somebody. And, you know, it's that building that developing, it's building and developing that level of, of trust and rapport is what give them, gives them the confidence, not only in me to help guide them along the way, but the confidence in their own bodies um, to move in a way that restores every single movement option that they can have available to them. And then also from a psychological standpoint, gives them one, the positive mindset, but then also two, uh, the trust and the confidence in their own body to move their, through their environment and to accomplish literally any type of goal or task that they are set out to to do that, well, you know, with their passion, their purposes in life. Yeah. You mentioned that you work with the U.S. military. Can you touch on what you do with them? Yeah. So typically uh, what that looks like is we go in for these four to seven day camps. Okay. So mm-hmm. Uh, for example, we'll, we'll go up to the different military bases and we'll go in there and essentially put on a show. And by, by we, I mean, it's me and a couple of other strength and conditioning coaches as well. And I you usually touch on things from uh, the movement standpoint and how we can incorporate strength and conditioning and physical therapy and rehabilitation together. Because, you know, to me, they're, they're really one and the same. They're just kind of different ends of the spectrum. And we could actually utilize them to work synergistically rather than separating them and kind of going around this vicious cycle of like, am I hurt? Am I injured? Am I training? Like what's going on here? Like, no, we could actually work on it all together. And that's really where a lot of the preventative stuff comes in. But uh, I'm also an educator as well. So I love teaching and I go up into these uh, military bases and essentially will put on different clinics for their providers as well. So the chiropractors, the PTs, the strength coaches, they, are, they have on staff. So we're not just uh, working with the uh, operators themselves, which is all, you know, obviously has an experiential benefit to it as well. And they work with them one-on-one. Uh, but then we also work with the staff that they have to make sure that there's a continuity of care, uh, so to speak, so we can actually uh, keep the ball rolling in a positive direction. Yeah. So what you do, how does that fit into shooting? Tell me how you work with, you said you, you work with the Olympic team, even the even mm-hmm. in Tokyo recently in 2020 or 2021, yep. whichever they're calling it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, you know, what did you yeah. do with these athletes and what, and how does that fit into the shooting sports? Sure. Sure. So kind of similarly to what we do with like all, all the military personnel is that I love assessing everybody on an individual basis, right. And kind of getting to know them and what their moving patterns are like and, and kind of how they, they live their lives and move their bodies while they're one at home, but then also two, on the shooting range for their specific, um, for their specific discipline. But primarily it, it's for me to get an idea of, uh, what their movement patterns look like, and then put that into consideration when maybe they do experience some level of pain or they are experiencing an injury or, you know, we see them out on the, uh, on the competition field, like when we're out traveling and, you know, they, they something cre- creeps in that they're not expecting. We can kind of triage it because I have a, a baseline of that, right? So I essentially will develop then uh, strength conditioning programs or movement programs for them as well to be working uh, working with on their own while we are not together in person. Because <laughs> quite honestly, it's like, hey, you know, we, we travel for two weeks and then I maybe not see you for a month or so. And then we'll come and travel again for two. I need to make sure that, you know, that they're doing things uh, in the interim to keep the progress uh, going as well. And because that's really where all the work is, is done, right? That's where all the, the, the uh, adaptations are made. It, it's not on the, the training grounds. It's all that in-between work where they're actually working on their functional limitations, stuff that we discover that's giving them that little 1% edge out on the competition fields. And then when we're out in the uh, competition mode and we're traveling, it's more about symptom management at that point. Mm -hmm. So like if something does come up, like, yes, we can use different manual techniques and different movements that will help desensitize uh, the pain, but essentially just keeping them in their tip top shape and helping them feel as comfortable as possible in these high stress environments to perform at their highest capability. And that's all from the movement standpoint. And then there's also the nutritional side of things where I know uh, Vincent Hancock, who I work with, and he won't mind me telling the story, but he's lost like 20 pounds in the past year or so, a little over a year. Right. And honestly, he looks the best he's ever been. He's moving the best that he's ever been. And he feels the best that he's ever have. And th- I think that says a lot because shooting definitely, or sorry, uh, nutrition definitely plays a, a huge, huge role uh, in the shooting sports as well from an endurance standpoint. And uh, from a, actually even a pain sensitivity and inflammation standpoint, which has, which has a very, very large impact on how well that you can perform and, and your perception 
of movement and pain uh, when we are competing. So do you give uh, your clients, is what we can call them, some sort of uh, nutrition plan and workout plan and and things like this to follow? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and and that looks different for everybody too. Right. So, yeah. so nutrition is, has always been a question that we've, you know, we've gotten emailed about or mm-hmm. messaged about, uh, you know, can someone go into nutrition, uh, when it comes to shooting and you know, my nutrition is go get a slim gym and something to drink <laughs> and ride around the course. <laughs> but oh, is I, it? Go ahead. <laughs> I know that's not, the, I know that's not right. So sure. Wh- sure. What should someone, fo- what should someone uh, carry with them or maybe the mm-hmm. night before eat mm-hmm. or, or drink or whatever it is before they go sure, out. Sure. Shoot. Well, I would, I would also, before we get into that, I would say we need to look at what the nutritional choices look like on just a regular day to day basis, because uh, okay. it, it, it can change like uh, based on like the elements and the, the environment and the weather. Uh, like for example, when we were in Tokyo, everybody was sweating a shit ton, right? Because it was like hundred percent humidity out there. That changes everything from a nutritional and hydration standpoint. Mm-hmm. Uh, but generally speaking, these are, these are my general recommendations and everybody can kind of take these and, and kind of roll with them is what we know from all of the nutritional research out there, whether that be on like vegan diets or carnivore diets or, you know, whatever these banana diets or these milk diets that people go on. It's crazy, right? right? What we know from all that research is that the healthiest people are the ones that eat the widest variety of foods. And the reason being is because it provides them more metabolic flexibility. Okay. So they can, they can handle a lot more when you start to eat on a very specific diet or an end of the spectrum, it limits, um, your body ability to process nutrients and to process certain foods. And what it ends up doing is you actually develop an allergy to foods as well because of that very restrictive, um, kind of diet. So there's essentially three different macronutrients, right? Everybody knows there's proteins, there's carbohydrates, and there's fats. So from a protein standpoint, everybody, need, <laughs> I'm sure all of our listeners are, are of this ideology of eating everything that has a mother, a face and a soul. So pretty much <laughs> animal protein, right? right. Where, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good way that's, to put it. <laughs> yeah. It, seriously though, it, it's where you're going to get the most, what we call bioavailability of, of nutrients and proteins and amino acids, the building blocks of the proteins that you need to have um, for repair of muscle tissue and other types of uh, tissues in the body. So it allows you to recover more from your training. Mm-hmm. It also help, really helps with hormone balance as well and keeping you um, kind, of, kind of in check in that regard. So you don't kind of, you don't go wonky, right? It also helps stave off hunger. So if you're looking to lose weight, uh, having a, a higher protein diet is going to help with um, sati- or society or satiety. So the feeling of being full right. as well. Yeah. And also it's, it's what builds tissue. So flesh builds flesh. If you want to build muscle tissue and get jacked, you should probably eat some animal protein as well. Yeah. But it, it makes it, we don't need to overcomplicate this shit. Right. <laughs> um, but, but from a, from like a, a carbohydrate standpoint, it, we kind of have to look at the different types of them, right? So there's the green leafy vegetables, there's, cause they have a carbohydrate source to them. And then there's like your potatoes and your rice and all that, uh, the different types of carbs, but essentially from a vegetable standpoint, I want everybody to eat the, col- the colors of the rainbow, right? So as many different colors of fruits and vegetables as you possibly can throughout the day, because they're going to give you all the different micronutrients that you need, a, a wide variety of those micronutrients. And then um, from the fat standpoint, it's going to be a healthy fat. So none of like your, none of your like uh, processed vegetable oils and stuff like that, but more so avocados and nuts and seeds and animal fat and coconut. Like these are all the the healthy fats. And then uh, from a carbohydrate standpoint, that's going to depend on your activity level. And what I mean by that is the starchy carbohydrates, right? So like your potatoes and your rice and uh, like squashes and, and stuff like that. And uh, that's going to depend like how much energy you're actually you, you're utilizing throughout the day right so if you're if you're going to be out on uh, like a shooting uh sporting clays course shooting all day long you're going to be walking around you're going to be expending a lot more energy than you would be just sitting at home on a couch watching netflix right right so when there's days that you're just at home and you're kind of relaxing it's probably a good idea to keep those carbohydrates a little bit lower and then on the days when you're way more active you can eat carbo- way more carbohydrates and actually be able to utilize them carbs don't make you fat unless you're actually not using them you know physical manner <laughs> yeah i have i have yeah i have a few friends that ride bicycles and i know that 
they talk about eating carbs a lot and how it gives them the energy they need to ride these bikes. And, uh, I know when I eat carbohydrates, I just seem to start getting fat. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you well, know, so. It's a, it's different, different type of energy production that they're doing. They're probably doing a whole hell of a lot more than you. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So right? these, so these diets that you, uh, let me ask yes. you this, these, these diets sure. you hear about where, um, the, the, I don't know the low carb diets, whatever you want to call them. Sure, are those healthy diets like keto? Keto and Atkins, yeah. I think, was it a long time yeah, ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was all is this healthy stuff to do or or not? So that's actually a really really good question, and uh, that brings up the point that like all of these uh, like these fat I'm going to call them fat diets that you see out there. So whether it be keto or Atkins, like I said, like the the vegan vegetarian side of things, there may be a time and place for every single one of them for the spe- for a specific individual. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is we we use it kind of like medicine as like from a specific dose, right? So for example, with the, um, like the the Atkins and the low carb, if you are diabetic, if you are overweight, it is going to be a good idea to maybe go on a lower carbohydrate diet like that, um, to be able to create more of the metabolic flexibility by teaching your body how to utilize uh, the blood sugar that it already has, right. And to put it into the muscles for for use for energy. And what that'll do, it'll actually one, keep you more satiated, like you're eating fat and protein. (laughs) So you'll technically, you'll bring in less calories throughout the day, Mm -hmm. which means you're, then you're going to, to lose weight. So there's like a very specific time point for them and, uh, a very specific, like, um, range of time that you're going to want to utilize it for. So it's not like, it can become the only diet that you eat for the rest of your life. It may be something that you utilize for like three to four months out of the year to lose some weight, make yourself more metabolically flexible, and then put yourself back on a a more diverse diet. Because you always want to go back to that more diverse if you can. But the the low carb stuff is very useful for for losing weight at the same time. It seems to me that that they say you can eat all the meat and the cheese and all the stuff that you want to, but it seems to me if you just keep piling it in, you're just going to keep getting bigger. But I may be wrong. Well, no, no, you're absolutely right because here's at the end of the day, it's the law of thermodynamics, folks. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Calories in and calories out matter. Meaning, the more calorie, if you're bringing in more calories and you're expending, you're going to gain weight. It doesn't matter where those calories come from. Right. It doesn't matter if it's all you know meat and cheese and Mm -hmm. eggs or if it's a uh, shit ton of potatoes yeah. and fruit. It, it, it's it's going to be a lot harder to eat all the potatoes and get that amount of calories. But um, it, there's there's these different qualitative factors we have to consider as well. Like, yes, quantity matters, but so does quality. You can't just eat a bunch of processed oils and um, processed cheeses and stuff and expect to be healthy either, right? Because right? there's a difference. You can lose weight, but it doesn't mean you're actually healthy on the inside. Yeah. And that that's the same thing w- that we see with movement. People are exercising a lot, which I think is fantastic, you know, but it's different than movement. And you can go to the extremes of it and actually damage yourself on the inside when it comes to like how your joints are degrading or uh, putting up, putting extra stress into maybe joints and tissues that aren't necessarily that you haven't developed enough um, uh, like capacity in to handle that stress and that load. And you could actually, you may look good on the outside. You may have a six pack, but mm-hmm. you could be metabolically broken on the inside at the same time. So can you go into that, go into the difference in exercise and movement? Oh, I literally just gave a whole entire lecture on this for the uh, National Strength and Conditioning Association, uh, their tactical <laughs> division in Norfolk, Virginia. So funny story. Um, I flew back from Tokyo into Chicago and then took a, a flight from Chicago to Norfolk because I presented literally the day after I landed from Tokyo. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I got into Norfolk like 10 o'clock at night. And I presented at 8 a.m. the next day. Uh, so I was wow. literally running on. Yeah, I was like running on no, no food. <laughs> no, I, it was, dude, it was, it was caffeine and cortisol and adrenaline for like the first four hours. And then I finally got some food in my system. And then I was like pounding coffee on the hour, every hour, just to keep myself awake yeah. to fight the jet lag. And then I switched to whiskey like right around four o'clock because I, need, I needed some type of substance <laughs> in my body to take me the rest of the day before I can finally go to bed yeah. and get up and come back to Arizona, which was like another three hour time jump back to the, the, the West Coast, which 
I had, I dealt with jet lag symptoms for about seven days after that. Um, wow. but anyway, yeah, going back to your question on, on, on the movement and the exercise thing here, here, here's the deal. Uh, exercise is really great at burning calories. So we're, we're good at doing that, right? We can go out and we can hike and we can jump on a bike and go ride 80 miles or we can, uh, go run or we could do CrossFit style classes and we can burn calories like that, but it doesn't mean that we're actually moving our body in the right way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a great example of that is if you look at a lot of these high intensity, uh, interval training classes, the, the focus is more on the quantity lifted. Or if you look at the endurance classes, the distance ran or like what the, the number is on the whiteboard or, you know, how much weight was on the bar or how fast I ran that, that hundred yard dash. And while all that stuff is, is great to, to measure, um, it's very easy to measure, which is why we do it, but it's, it's not looking at the quality of the movement that's occurring in the human body. Right. So the example that I give is if you look at like a power lifter mm -hmm. or like a strongman competitor. There's a reason why these guys end up getting joint replacements by the time they're in their 40s. They get new knees and new hips because they move in a very specific way, i.e., like, for example, up down with a lot of heavy load, and there's not a lot of variety. Right. Okay. We don't, we don't teach the body to move in other planes of motion. We just kind of go up down under a lot of heavy load. And essentially, that means that your joints are only experiencing uh, load into very specific areas of them. So you start wearing them away over time. Whereas I think of movement as more varietal in nature, right? So with, with movement, we're teaching our body how to teaching our brain and our body how to handle low, how to handle the load that we all experience every day, which is gravity throughout the fullest ranges of motion capable for our joints and for how our body is built. Mm -hmm. Right. And looking more at the quality of it and building more um, what I call mobility and capacity. So mobility to me is not just like how flexible you are, Right. It's how many options for movement that you have. So like if you get into a compromised position, let's say like out there running, like you step off the curb wrong, or like you, you go to have this happen all the time. You go to like pick something out in the yard or like pick up somebody's like one of your kids toys and you, you bend over and you jack up your back. There's a reason why that happened, right? You just, you didn't have um, the capacity in that range of motion and your brain felt defensive over it. So it sent out these pain signals. Well, what if we explored more mo movement? What if we explored more ranges of motion? What if we gave you more capacity through different types of, of patterns and, and flexibility and had you in, put you into these patterns where you failed, right? Because failure is important because failure is where we learn mm -hmm. and then taught your body how to control those ranges of motion. Well, now you have way more mobility, right? Now you can, you have way more movement options so that should you get stuck in these maybe compromising positions, you can come out of them unscathed. Hmm. It's interesting. So all mm -hmm. of, all of this, how can the average shooter take any mm -hmm. of this stuff and improve their performance? Do they, do, is, is the only way to do that is to see you? Uh, no, 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 no. And, and, and listen, like, I don't want to like try and, push anybody away from exercising and what in a way that they feel is good for their body because i'd rather you be exercising and moving your body than sitting on the couch all day long wow. but when it comes specifically to shooting uh, there's there's a couple of different i would say limiting factors that i typically see that people can work on um readily at home in and of themselves and that is one from an endurance standpoint Right. So mm -hmm. having the, the capacity to handle the amount of training that's necessary to be good at the sport. And then also, too, you start to see these little nagging pains and injuries start to develop in things like the neck and the low back and the shoulder just from the specific positions um, that they're put in. And essentially what happens is they get stuck in these positions of like that rounded shoulder. Right. Mm -hmm. The neck is kind of cocked back. The wrists stay in one position and the trunk is leaned forward. Right. Uh, so we're thinking like with a shotgun specifically for like sporting clays and trap and ski. So um, f from a, a movement standpoint, it would just take you into the complete opposite position. So I think more of like opening up the chest and bringing the shoulders back and taking the legs behind the body when, to what we call extension instead of being forward, right? Mm -hmm. And then also from a rotational standpoint, okay? So for example, like a, a right-handed shooter, is going to be pulled forward on the left of the upper body and pulled back on the right. Mm -hmm. So we'd want to be able to do more movement where the right side of the body comes forward and the left 
side of the body moves back. So it's essentially like taking a lot of the movements that you do shooting and just do the exact opposite. Now, I will say from a generality standpoint, most shooting athletes do not spend enough time barefoot. And this is primarily like the biggest thing that all shooting athletes could do is spend more time barefoot because it's going to have the largest impact on your performance as an athlete. And here's why. So your feet actually have the highest amount of um, sensory receptors found anywhere in the body right? So they, they collect a lot of what we call like nutritional information that gets sent into your brain and your brain is ultimately what dictates how you move. Okay. So it dictates how seamless and effortless your movement patterns are. If you're more seamless and effortless moving the gun, you're going to be way more accurate versus being uh, like really handsy with it or hurt, like uh, jerky with it. And, and you're trying to move the gun instead of feeling how the gun moves you. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Yep. So like we call that proprioception and kinesthetic awareness, which is essentially knowing where your body's at in space without having to think about it. These are the most accurate athletes. And actually Vincent Hancock does a really great job um, demonstrating all this because he's very process oriented. He's not thinking at all when he's up at his station, not even a little bit. He goes through his process. It's all repetition and he's feeling into his body. And he's feeling into what he needs to do with the gun. He's not thinking about it at all. And that feeling comes down through the feet. So that's one thing that we worked on a lot with all the shooting athletes, not just him, is their capacity uh, to feel into the feet. And by the only way you can do that is by going barefoot. Because we spend so much time in shoes, all those sensory receptors in the bottom of the feet only get exposure to essentially one type of stimulus, and that's the cushion in the bottom of the shoe. So they're like little shoe prison. So one of the, the best things that you can do is just spend as much time barefoot on different textures. So car or carpet, tile, hardwood, um, gravel, grass. Uh, I don't go outside much right now in Arizona because I'll literally burn all the skin off the bottom of my feet. But it's 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 important to <laughs> it's it's important to expose your feet to as many different textures as possible from a sensory standpoint, and then as much different as many different movement patterns as possible. So training barefoot. And teaching, like, everybody's always, uh, for whatever reason, really fearful of allowing with their foot to pronate or flatten to the ground. Well, it needs to do that, right? It needs to actually be able to flatten to the ground. It needs to be able to lift up and create an arch. And I'll give you an example here with uh, moving the gun as well. So, like, if you had to make a move to the left as a right-handed shooter, when you have to rotate over your left leg, that arch needs to lift up on that left foot. However, to make you an efficient mover... If you make that same move, that right side foot arch needs to flatten to the ground. Hmm. That's what tells the hips and the pelvis how to move efficiently versus if you keep both feet rigid, now you can't get the natural rotation through the hips and the pelvis. And this is where you end up having to move more of the upper body and move more of the arms, which is going to make you uh, more inaccurate. Should someone stand a different way to make this work better? Yeah. So here's, uh, here's what I typically see. So the, I, I feel like the best shooting position is having a soft bend in your knees because if the knees are locked out, you don't, and you can practice this. Like you could stand up right now. If you're not like listening to this in the car, if you lock your knees out, as you stand up straight and try to rotate your body, you're not going to get a lot of movement versus having a soft bend in the knees and having a little bit more of weight uh, towards that forefoot, like towards the big toe knuckle and the fifth toe knuckle, mm -hmm. that transverse arch of the foot, like out towards the toes. Now you have a lot more bandwidth, right? You have a lot more freedom or degrees of freedom to move the hips. It's going to be a lot, a lot smoother as well. And then uh, also from like a width standpoint, one of the big things that I see happening is if you take too wide of a stance, yeah. you're going to, you're going to limit, you're going to block your hips. So now the, the femurs cannot rotate inside the acetabulum of the, uh, the hip joint as freely because you put them into a bony block, essentially what happens. So too narrow, you're going to start to sh change um, the amount of balance you have because you have a, a smaller base of support, mm -hmm. but too wide, you're going to start to limit motion. So you kind of, it's good to have that, like that middle ground, which tends to be like feet just underneath the hips mm -hmm. and not outside the shoulders. So if you've got a shooting stance and it looks like you're riding a horse, you're going to have some yep. problems with some crossers. Exactly. And, yeah. and here's the thing, you may feel really stable because that's a wide base of support. You're going to feel strong in that position, yeah. but it's going to limit your mobility. Yeah. You know, I was shooting with David Radulovich 
uh, at the North Central Regional in Wisconsin a couple of weeks ago. And, and he walked up and I said, David, what kind of shoes are you wearing? Those have got to be the ugliest <laughs> shoes I've ever seen. And he went into all this, which you're just saying. And yeah, yeah. he said, there's no support on these shoes. It's just basically a sole. Yep. And, and he shot unbelievably that weekend. I'm not saying, it was sh- <laughs> I'm not saying it was because of the shoes, well, but it's kind of funny that you say that. And I'm thinking about what he was wearing. One, he's a, an amazing shooting athlete to begin with. Like <laughs> he's very skilled. Right. Uh, I will, I will tell you this because even Kaylee gave me some shit for it is that I got him onto these Vivo barefoot shoes. So that's what you saw, ah. uh, which is, it's, it's, I wear them around too. Okay, so tell uh, everybody I, what that is so they'll know what to get if they want to do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, there's a couple of different shoe brands out there um, that are more minimalistic in nature. Mm-hmm. But Vivo Barefoot is the, the brand that I like the most. And it's it, seriously, it's just from a stylistic standpoint. I think they're the, they're the best designed. Um, but essentially, you should look for four different things when you're trying to pick out a shoe. Okay, number one, that toe box need to be as wide as possible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you can use you say some room for your actual your foot and your toes to move around it uh number two we need to have it to be flat so wide as possible and then number two flat meaning if you look at it from a, a millimeter heel to toe drop scenario it should be zero so completely flat okay the third the third uh characteristic is flexible meaning i should be able to take that shoe and essentially fold it and bend it up into like a little square <laughs> it should be able to, to, to move so that your foot can articulate freely um, inside the shoe itself. And then lastly is it needs to be as thin as possible. Hmm. And what that means is the sole of that shoe needs to be able to protect your foot, which is the main role of a shoe anyway, uh, but needs to be essentially thin enough that you can feel the ground beneath your feet to get that sensory input up into the brain that gives your brain that nutritious information to improve your kinesthetic awareness and your proprioception and improve your accuracy. So just to recap, wide, flat, flexible, and thin. Okay. And I think, I think Vivo Barefoot does a great job of that. They actually, I'm on their website right now. They don't have bad looking shoes. No. mm -mm. And they come out with new styles all the time. The only downside is that like once they go and they're out of those sizes, they're pretty much out of them for a little while. So if you find a style that you like and they have them in your size, go ahead and jump on it. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So I'll see uh, people running around as far as exercising with actually Mm -hmm. barefoot. Yes. And this is why. And this is why. Yep. So I'm actually barefoot like 99% of the day, except when um, I actually have to go out public somewhere where they, you know, it's kind of frowned upon to not have shoes on. But um, if it were me, I would, I'd be everywhere barefoot if I could. But also there's a cleanliness standpoint to it too. Like I get that, but I'm also that guy, like when I travel uh, with USA, USA shooting to the airports, I'm that guy that's crawling around on the, the airport floors with my, on my hands and my bare feet and moving. So I guess I'm just going to be that weird guy and that's okay with me because my body feels great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you are used to being in very big cushiony shoes, mm-hmm. like think, Hoka's is one of those popular brands or mm-hmm. anything that has a really uh, like a, a steep heel, heel to toe drop. Or if you're used to wearing orthotics, you can't just go right to those shoes because your feet will likely revolt on you because you haven't yet de- uh, developed enough of the capacity in those foot muscles and those foot tissues to handle that new load because they actually have to work now because essentially your shoes have been doing the job for the longest time. So, how- However, I will... How do you, how do do you train your feet to go into those shoes? Great, great question. So, uh, if you're wearing orthotics, right. Number one, I would take the orthotics out and just wear the shoes that they were in for a little while. So you typically see, I see people do it for like four to six weeks Mm -hmm. to walking around them in the shoes now without the orthotics. Or if you don't wear wear orthotics, every shoe comes with some type of an insert. So you would just take the insert out and walk around in the shoes without the insert in. Okay. And that's a good way to, Hey, Tell your feet that, oh, we got to work a little bit harder. And it's not so much load right away with your body weight against gravity that you could start to strengthen them up a little bit, right? Yeah. And then after doing a few weeks of that, once your your feet feel a little bit better and not as sore, because your feet are going to get sore, I can promise you that. So once they're not as sore, you can then start to look at more minimalistic type shoes. And what I mean by that is going, if you're in like a, a heel to toe, like a, a steep heel to toe drop, go down to a zero millimeter heel to toe drop. 
and start to lower yourself there. And then eventually after, once again, going for a few weeks in these more minimalistic shoes, then you can eventually go down to something like a Vivo Barefoot, which is by far the most minimalistic. Do, do all shoes, are they always heel to toe drop? Is there any flat shoes that are not? Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. So something like uh, like a Vans or a Converse, uh-huh. those are typically, I mean, they are, they're flat shoes, but they have that big rubber cushion shoe sole on them mm-hmm. and they're not real narrow or sorry. They're not real wide in the toe box. Yeah. Right. So and this is what I did when I was progressing my feet as I went to a van, but then I bought them about a half size bigger so that my foot could actually spread out in them a little bit more. Hmm. And then I taught my feet to, to, you know, get stronger in those shoes. And then I eventually went down to, um, actually my very, very first, uh, shoe was a New Balance Minimus. It was like a it was like a trail running minim- minimal shoe, and then eventually got into uh, the Vivo Barefoots after that when they came on the market. Is this all you wear so I, now? I wear uh, I wear those Vivo Barefoots, and I also wear a, like a barefoot sandal called Earth Runners. Okay. Huh. Yep. Yep. Well, it's all different to me, man. All that. Yeah, stuff. And I do actually have a <laughs> I have a code for those Earth, Earth Runners if anybody's. Uh, interested in that put them on <laughs> tell them what is it tell yep. them what it is it's just it's capital m capital v capital m capital n capital t so it's movement without the um the vowel so just movement with all the consonants huh. yep so you can go on there and those are those are great shoes uh great sandals to wear around if, especially if you don't like i mean i like uh wearing as little as possible around my feet so it's great here for in arizona when you can just kind of slip those guys on and they don't mess with your foot mechanics and they're super minimalist as well, so they're they're constantly stimulating your feet. If I'm shooting several rounds a day at a tournament, yes, okay, and it's gonna it's, it has to take a toll on your arms. You know, holding mm-hmm, this gun up. Mm-hmm. Um, what exercises can you do to make this a lot easier so that you don't get so fatigued towards the end of the day? Yeah, yeah. So here here's the thing with the upper body is there's essentially two different. Uh, types of movements uh, the upper body can do. One is called open chain and the other is called closed chain. So the only difference between those two is open chain is meaning that your hand's not really attached to something, right? So think about doing like a bicep curl. That would be an open chain movement, okay? The hand's attached to a a dumbbell, uh, but you're essentially your shoulder's fixed and you're moving your elbow and your wrist on the fixed shoulder, Okay. okay? The other example would be a closed chain movement, which would, the best example for this would be something like a push up. okay? You have your hands attached to the ground, Mm -hmm. which means they are the fixation point. They're the anchor point, and you're bending your elbows and your shoulders over the fixed hands. So to create more stability around the shoulders, it's a lot more beneficial to do these closed chain types of movements, uh, but in a way where essentially, excuse me, that the elbow is almost like locked out in a way, because that's going to force your shoulder blade uh, to move on your rib cage, which is the foundation of the shoulder, which is where we have the most capacity um, to hold the gun, right? To be able to withstand the forces of holding that gun all day long. It's when we have a weak, um, what we call scapulothoracic joint in a way. So like that foundation where the, we call all the periscapular muscles are on the, the rib cage and holding the shoulder blade together. Mm-hmm. When those become fatigued, we get, we have to resort to things like our biceps and our triceps and our forearm muscles and they're just not built to handle and withstand a lot of that um, a lot of that resistance a lot of that force a lot of that load so when i'm training the the shooting athletes to build more capacity in the shoulders we're doing different things that <laughs> that ironically look like almost like yoga and gymnastic type movements okay and yes we can we can build in some aesthetics by you know the ten thousand reps of bench press that everybody loves doing in high school um, yeah. <laughs> but you know what? It's actually, it's really, cause I know you've been there, right? Oh yeah. Like, here, here, here's the ironic part about that is everybody's all about building up the chest. But if you talk to any female, you know what they're always after the back. That's right. Back. Yeah. Yeah. So like, who are we impressing? Other dudes is essentially what, where that goes. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. and actually for a shooting athlete from a functionality standpoint, building up the chest, um, is not going to do you as, as much of a benefit is, is building up the upper back as well. So, so what, what about, exercises? Rowing? Yep. So lots of rows. So okay. I like doing a lot of rows with rotation. 
So if you think about like a, a single arm dumbbell row, where you essentially have one hand attached to a bench and the other hand's holding the dumbbell. You familiar with this movement? I know it's really tough to yeah. describe this over a podcast, but uh, so let's just say we're doing the right hand as the rowing arm. Mm -hmm. That right leg is going to get kicked back behind you. So you're going to be in like a split stance. And that's going to, that's important because that's actually going to lengthen out your lat, which is really important here uh, from a big back muscle. And what I like to do is create a lot more rotation, right? Because I think shooting a shotgun is very much a rotational sport. Right. So what we do is have that dumbbell move across that front foot which is going to put a big stretch through all of the, the muscles on the upper back and inside the, and on the rib cage and everything. And then we're going to drive the elbow up to the, the rib cage or up to the hip and then use that hand that's on the bench to actually press the body away and rotate the trunk to where you're looking up towards the ceiling. Hmm. You need that's, to, and that's, yeah. You need I got a, a bunch of videos on all this stuff. Too, I was going to say, you but, need to post one of those on your social media so I can send people I there. can I will totally do that yeah uh, I got a bunch on YouTube as well so we could we can link back to that too yeah yeah all right uh hydration Ooh, yeah <laughs> is this just as important as anything else uh absolutely um and here's here's you know I'm always going to start with where people get it wrong <laughs> first okay. so uh 10 most people tend to overhydrate actually than underhydrate. I know that sounds really counterintuitive, but what happens is we drink too much water because you know we're in these hot environments like Tokyo was, very hot and very humid, mm -hmm. and you end up diluting your electrolytes. Okay. Um, and that is not good for your neuromuscular system. Okay. And the reason why it's not good is because you need those electrolytes to catalyze all the the reactions inside your cells and inside your body that stimulate your muscle to contract. And that also stimulates your eyes to be efficient as well. So you've got a bunch of muscles that actually control your eyes. So it, it affects them in the same way. So your vision can start going and your accuracy can start going as well from a visual standpoint. Um, so what I had people do is uh, essentially drink salt. <laughs> wow. uh, specifically, I like these element salt packs and that's LMNT. Uh, they have a, a nice ratio of uh, sodium, potassium, and magnesium, which are the three uh, essential electrolytes that we need for good, you know, neuromuscular contraction. So, uh, if you're drinking, I, I kind of, I kind of like it as like a like a one to two ratio in a way. So, uh, for every, let's just say, two water bottles, mm -hmm. we're drinking one of uh, one filled with the salt packet. So, for most people, that's looking like two to three of these salt packets a day. If you're in these really hot environments where you're sweating a lot and you're losing a lot of water. Okay. Hmm. But generally speaking, um, but most of us, if you eat a clean diet, like everything that I, I talked about earlier, not eating a bunch of processed foods, mm -hmm. if you're eating a clean diet, you're likely not getting enough of these salts in throughout the day. Um, if you're eating a very processed diet, you're probably getting way too much sodium in, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. but if you are, but if you are eating a more of a clean diet, we do need to, to supplement with some of these uh, salt packets and or really heavily salting your food. Will you be able to tell a difference if you do drink these packets? Absolutely. And I'll, I'll tell you where it, where it comes, uh, where you feel it the most is usually mentally, right? So I'm going to talk personally for me and then based off of talking to all these athletes as well, there's a lot of brain fog mm -hmm. that happens or lack of mental clarity or not being able to find words or um, slowing down in decision-making or uh, reaction time are some of the biggest uh, uh, signs and symptoms of lack of like the lack of hydration, lack of electrolyte balance. Hmm. Let me ask you this because yes. I've, I've tried this and I seem to like it, but then I talk to some other people and they say, it's no good. Uh, there's a, <laughs> there's a product called alpha brain from on. Oh yeah. Yeah. Have you had any experience with any of this? They say it keeps you or supposed to keep you alert and, you know, and focused. And focused. And, yeah, have you, that, have yeah. you heard of anything like that? Yeah. So these are that brand of supplement is called a nootropic. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it there's these specific ingredients in it. I'm not going to go into a chemistry class here, uh, but there's right. <laughs> specific ingredients in it that cross your blood, blood brain barrier and improve the cognitive function of your brain. So there's you know different ones that different. Um, essentially chemicals and nutrients that do different things to the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them being alertness, the other one being, you know, focus, being able to stay more focused. Uh, they usually add a little bit of caffeine to them as well. And things like alpha GPC that help with memory and cognition is another, another piece to, to that puzzle as well. And they do work. 
they do work. You just need to make sure that you're essentially that you're getting a high enough dose of them. And that's going to be dependent essentially on like body size. So like I'm a six foot one, 205 pound dude. I'm not really that tiny. Uh, so I would, I would need to have a higher dose than say somebody, you know, who's, you know, five, five, one forty. Uh, so, and, and that, that those alpha brains are typically, uh, like any other supplement are made for the average individual, which is usually like a five, seven to five, eight, 180 pound male. So you'd have right, to, so, so I'd have to take two or three doses. So the way that you do this is you have to titrate yourself, right? So I would take one packet, assess your tolerance <laughs> to it. If you feel like you're getting an effect from it. Yeah. That's great. You can stick with that because yeah. everybody metabolizes substances differently. Um, and then if you feel like you're not, then you might want to do like maybe a packet and a half. I will tell you this, and this is kind of going off the topic of shooting. But if you do like to partake in some libations, so if you, <laughs> if you do like to, to, to drink whiskey or red wine or any type of alcohol for that matter, there's a, a epic combination that I'm going to tell you guys about right now that literally prevents and cures hangovers. And it involves your nootropics that you're talking about. Okay. You ready, you ready for this? I'll, and the only reason. Yeah, I'm ready. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the only reason why I know this is because a few years ago, I did a 12 bars of Christmas, <laughs> which right. means you're having like a, a drink or two at each of these bars, which you can do the math on that. That's a lot of alcohol. Right. Um, but the only reason why I survived is because I used this combination. And the combination are the those element salt packs. So I would be drinking those throughout the night. I literally had like three or four of them. And then the nootropics, so like an alpha brain drinking like right before you, you take one of those down right before you start drinking. And then the third one is activated charcoal. And these usually come in like little capsules. And essentially what they do is they go into the stomach and bind the toxins of the alcohol before they can get to the liver. So you get the activated charcoal is binding the toxins of the alcohol from the inside out. You got the nootropics like the alpha brain that protect the blood brain barrier, right? Because if you think about it, like the alcohol gets to the brain, that's causes your headaches. It makes you disoriented and everything. Mm -hmm. And then the salt packets keep you hydrated. <laughs> huh. So then, yeah. So then, I mean, I woke up after that. I felt like a freaking champ. So alpha brain before <laughs> you start drinking. Yep. About four salt packets while you're drinking. And then char depending on the length of, yeah. And then charcoal drinking. after? Charcoal during, during. Okay. Just take his charcoal mm -hmm. pill. Yep. Well, wow. and you can get them. I mean, you can find them on Amazon. That, They're all pretty much the same. It's free advice. <laughs> hey, there's a lot of people. It is. There's a lot of people listening to this. that's going to do that. I promise you. I'm I'm sure because you know <laughs> we're, we're that type of crowd, right? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. This is all interesting to me. It's the stuff that I never talk about. I mean, I don't. You know, I've I've thought about Alpha Brain. I've thought I've used it. I felt like it made me better or feel better, and sure. then. And then somebody says, oh, that's not, not, that stuff's a bunch of, it's a bunch of bull. Don't, don't be taking that. So then I stop. Um, but yeah, that on it brand, which makes mm -hmm. alpha brain, it seems like they've got their stuff together. Some, if you want to go check that out, whoever's listening, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's a lot of good supplements. It looks, that's why I was asking you about that. Well, it's quality. Like it's, it's a better quality than a lot of the stuff that you might find on like Amazon, yeah. which you, I mean, you can't get that. I think you get it like pretty much everything on Amazon these days, but, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's important to do your research behind that or take the advice of people who do, to do, do the research behind it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so is it better to take a powder or like a pill form of this nootropic? It, does, it, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. That's irrelevant. I've had a, I've had a, I've had a good time listening to this because it's just, like I said earlier, it's just a whole, <laughs> it's a whole lot of different stuff. I appreciate you coming on yeah. and sharing all this yeah, with, absolutely. with me and, and uh, tell people how they can find you online, social media, whatever it is. Yeah, so I'm very responsive on on the Instagrams. So my handle is at Rooted in Movement. And once again, the movement is uh, just MVMNT uh, for my acronym there. And then actually, if you guys, if anyone wants to reach out to me via email, just Matthew at RootedInMovement.com and uh, respond pretty well through there. And then you can check out my website, uh, RootedInMovement.com as well. Yeah, a lot of good information. I oh, like that. oh, oh, wait, one more thing. I actually have a podcast myself. What is and it? I forget about that. What is it? It is Rooted in Movement, the podcast. And uh, I have about eight episodes in right now. So it's a, it's a new venture for me. Uh, but there are already three episodes that specifically talk about shooting. Um, there's one about how I got into the Olympic shootings, um, sports, and then as a PT. And then I just did a recap on the Olympics. Um, actually that's going to be released this week and then i did a very specific episode on pain in the shooting athlete nice well i will we'll yeah. tag all that in the in the show notes and 
that way everybody well, cool. can find, find what you're yeah i appreciate that find your podcast and all your links and everything like that but anyway awesome. i appreciate you coming on man and and, and look forward to talking yeah, to you thank again you. appreciate you too yeah we definitely gotta do another one of these yeah man sounds good thank you bud